Buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por venir, por su interés en uh, Ralf Passel, que es visita de Alemania o arquitecto alemán de la oficina Passel Künzel, que Uh, va a mostrar hoy día algo de su trabajo que ha hecho en los últimos años y además es profesor de la TU Berlín, lo que significa que es uno de los organizadores de la Summer School que, a la cual estamos invitados en agosto de, de este año. Por lo cual queríamos uh, hacer hoy día, después de la charla, una pausa de cinco minutos y después reunirnos con los interesados de la Summer School ahí, acá mismo, uh, como después de la charla. Vamos ahí a la charla, cinco minutos pausa para que la gente que no se interesa puede irse y se quedan los que le interesa lo que pasa con la Summer School, escuchando las noticias que nos ha traído el, el profesor. Bueno, a mí me toca ahora presentarle a él y después le doy la palabra a él. Ralf Passel empezó a estudiar ingeniería en 91, de pronto se cambió a arquitectura y después de estarías en Liverpool y París, terminó en 98 en la TU de Dresden sus estudios de arquitectura. Él trabajó en diferentes oficinas de arquitectura, entre ellos en oficinas de renombre como lo de Jean Nouvel y Santiago Calatrava. Antes de abrir su propia oficina en Rotterdam, que un poco después tenía una filial también en Berlín. Eh, entre 2002 y 2005 era profesor de la TU de Delft y actualmente se desempeña como profesor de diseño y construcción en la TU Berlín. Su trabajo profesional desarrolló en el campo del hábitat en su condición urbana. Al pensar formas de vivienda hay que repensar también el tejido urbano en el cual se va a insertar la nueva propuesta. Tiene como un lema de su oficina, no hay detalles sin discusión urbana y no hay propuesta urbanística sin detalle. Siempre le interesan como todas las escalas de un proyecto, no solamente la la intervención puntual, sino también siempre el contexto completo en cual se va a insertar. La eh, grande o chica, la escala, la, la tarea es igual de importante para esa oficina. Lo trata con la misma energía, una propuesta para un nuevo barrio urbano o para una extensión de una cocina. Le ha, traba le ha tocado trabajar en varios proyectos de conversión de edificaciones preexistentes dentro del tejido urbano, como un antiguo matadero, una fábrica de cerveza, una estación de tren o una área portuaria. Y algunos de, esos, de estos proyectos nos va a presentar hoy día en la tarde. Muchas gracias y dejo la palabra a Ralf Basel. Mucha, muchas gracias, uh, Marion. Uh, muchas gracias a uh, ustedes. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I make it very easy for myself and speak in English. I hope that's fine. If I'm speaking too fast, just give me a sign so I can maybe slow down a little bit. Um, or if something really exciting happens and you didn't understand, maybe someone can translate. But I think if we translate the whole lecture, then we're going to be here tomorrow and the weather is far too good to ruin the day with a lecture in 12 o'clock in the noon. Okay, thank you um, again. And uh, for me, it's very, it's very pleasant to give a talk, not about so much from the academic context, but much more from my professional background because in Germany or in Europe, um, that's similar to here, but then again slightly different, we have that tradition that the design teachers, the design professors, they are asked to become a professor because 
of their practical experience in architecture. So it's impossible to become a professor of architecture without having built, without having had the battle out there in reality to get your projects done. And that is, of course, obviously why you're all here to kind of rehearse that, simulate that on various designs and studios. You're going to follow through your studies as are our students in Berlin. Um, we are mainly preoccupied with housing issues. The housing issue in, let's say, Central Europe, but probably most over Europe, is turning into a very crucial topic. Um, it's been like 15, 20 years ago, something people wouldn't start studying architecture for. It was seen as something like, ah, oh yeah, housing is there, it's available, it pops out. It's sort of a self-organizing system, and it's very hard to intervene with architecture. And it's true to some extent that there are a lot of restrictions in housing or limitations, considering budget, which is always very limited. You're dealing with real people instead of institutions, which from the daily routine of an architect doesn't make things always easier because the group you're dealing with is always much bigger than just one representative of an institution. And you're dealing with sort of urban issues like that are more on a global level, like questions of densification, positioning yourself, positioning your architecture in the context of the society, of the responsibility, how to deal with ground surfaces, land titles, and so on. So it's also, to some degree, very political. No? And it gets more political the more social you get. Right. Social. The problem with this microphone is that I keep running and then I, I'm, I'm a bit stuck behind this wooden block. But apart from that, my neck is going to hurt later, but never mind. <laughs> um, um, so um, the, the especially the social housing, and I'm going to show you some of them, they are, they are highly political. No, They are, uh, well, not only on a societal level, but also on a political level. It subsidized housing and so on and so on. So how to deal with that as a society is one of the principal questions we are always confronted with. And especially, well, uh, you, you're going to see that, that all our housing projects are placed in an urban context. So none of the houses, we never did a house outside an agglomeration, let's say, outside an, a city scale. And this is also why we sort of try to apply the same strategies and the same ideas in different contexts. And you're going to probably recognize some of them um, during the, the talk. Well, this is what I thought. No, this is not working, and I'm too small to. So um, ah, now it's working. <laughs> <laughs> no, say that, pro because probably that's the switch. If you sit there, it, no, anyway. <laughs> so um, everything deals also, uh, wi which sounds a bit funny from this very intense urban experiences, you know, from Latin American cities, but from a European context, cities are a bit more um, sleepy, maybe, a bit more quiet, not so, not so exciting. So the issue is also an issue about how to intensify the use of the city, how to mix uses, because we are, have a big tradition in housing here, offices there, and so on, which is obviously the aftermath of the modern um, development. See? So um, Marion already kind of 
told half of my lecture. This is um, what you recognize from her introduction. Um, we keep saying that we are actually no architects. We are city makers. We deal with the city, and the city has different scales. It has different approaches. It has a different attitude um, on to the built reality, onto architecture. So there's a dependency between scales and a dependency between program and a dependency between people. And these topics we're gonna we're gonna work on on one side with the office, obviously, but also I keep try to introduce the same topics, housing issues into university. And I can tell you that in the last seven years since I'm in Berlin, the topic of housing has become more and more and more and more popular. It's by far the most popular architectural issue we are dealing with today. None of our students are interested in designing museums, which are never going to build anyway. But they are all into housing because this is actually where most of you, um, or at least of your Berlin colleagues, um, will face their future. Um, we applied similar strategies on different locations and also see our work as sort of a, as a research field, testings, um, experiments, if you want, and uh, also evaluate them for a longer period of time. Um, we approach them through physical models. This is the studio of our first year in Berlin. It's a total mess, as you can see, but I'm totally convinced that there's a lot of ingenuity in here and a lot of spirit that hopefully, hopefully goes out into the world and be realized in the future very often. The, the crooks, let's say, the, the, the challenge is always that we, we're digital, we're in a digital world, but we communicate a lot through analog means. So this ambiguity between the physical and the digital is something we, um, we consider as very valuable. And this is actually one of my favorite images because this is also like how we work in the office. It's uh, uh, the only thing you have to take care of is that the glue is not getting into your computer, okay? But you're, you're, you're doing both parallel and one is informing the other. And what you learn here, what you what you discover on the digital journey, you immediately, you transfer into a physical model and back and forth. So it's this iterational design process that uh, keeps us busy and that's always be falling back to the question, what is actually every part in a, in a piece of architecture and how do the parts join in order to make it a bigger piece, no? an oeuvre or a building, a piece of architecture? And immediately you recognize obviously what that is, but who of you would know how to assemble this, even though all the parts are right in front of you? And could you give a guarantee that the thing works as it's supposed to work in the end? Well, it's gonna be, it's gonna be hard, no? And that's, that's a tricky point about architecture that we know all the parts and we're dealing with it in our everyday life we have a place to live, we all live, no? we all have a house, we all work or go to university, we all have space around it, so we know what we're talking about. But actually, are we able to configurate the spaces in a way that they work in the end, in a architectural qualitative level? So, um, I'm only show two images of what we did with, uh, with our students, and I put them in because uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to join the studio of Camilo and, and Nina later. Um, and I looked up your website and I was totally impressed by, the, by the, the, the process of how you make architecture, at least from what I could get uh, in the, on your website. And um, this is also what we also try, and which is also referring to the summer school we're going to talk about after the, after the, uh, the lecture, um, that we try with our students to leave the university and to get things built, designed and built. So make a collaborative design, collective design. It's, it's a co-process if you want, and then kind of build it together, hands-on, physically. I'm sure that, I'm convinced that every architecture student should have built a house before graduating 
or be part of that process because it's really an, a very enriching thing. And here you see some of the, that was in Bolivia, you see some of the German and the Cochabambino uh, students working together on this agricultural school. That was in the second phase extended by a little boarding house. So that is also something that is academic work if you want, but it goes beyond the physical space of the university. And that is my deepest understanding and my conviction that as an architect you work in a societal context. You work with people, you work in a, in a, a, a cultural field. It's, a, it's an art of culture, if you want. That is a different art of culture. This is our Berlin lab. This is where we are, um, actually on the fourth floor here. This is our, this is our floor um, with our team. shouldn't have pressed that button on yet. <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm showing you these images just to understand the, the context I'm talking of um, or what the background, what my background is. So that is uh, just like one of these postcard images of Berlin. Um, most of you have seen similar images of any European city. That is my other home. I'm, I'm sort of trapped in two worlds. Uh, Rotterdam, I've been living in Rotterdam for nearly 20 years and working there and my professional life is, you see that in the projects, is very, very deeply connected to the philosophy of Dutch housing, actually. Um, just shows you that the, the, the city of Rotterdam is a city which is, and that is my critique on that image, which is composed of singular objects rather than a continuous public realm. So um, every day we're confronted with that mess, to be honest, and try to make urban spaces out of it that work on a human scale. Um, and we do that um, by very traditional means. We use traditional material that is available we try to transfer it into contemporary architecture. Obviously, we are dealing with different needs and different wishes and different programs as well. But in the end of the day, we are still constructing the city. We are still part of a bigger, of a bigger whole. We are just one of the screws of that chainsaw. Uh, we are not the chainsaw. We are just one of the, of the parts of that urban fabric. So these questions of transparency or communicating through a house, through a dwelling, a residence with the urban space is something that is really fascinating us and that is um, driving, that's a, an, an engine of our work. So um, r strongly related to this question is the question how do we want to live and how do we live in an urban context the Netherlands have the same population than Chile, only the size is a bit different, as you all know. Um, it goes from here to Santiago and back, that's it, 16, 17 million actually. Yeah? So it's a country that is totally populated wherever you go. You can't be on your own at all. Um, it's quite an, an, a stressful experience on one side. On the other side, the cities, they're not intense. It's all, it's everywhere the same. It's low rise, high dense, nothing very special you would remember apart from the historical sites, of course, Amsterdam and so on. But um, for the rest, let's say like 16 and a half million live, I don't know, totally in, in indifferent spatial urban conditions. So how do we build that city? Um, and in every project, Obviously, we have a big fight with the um, municipalities about the freedom as an architect we could use. Um, how free are we to implement new ideas or how much are we bound into this historical context, into heritage issues and so on. And um, I want to show you this project. Um, I, I come back to that in a minute because this is the 
most traditional project we've done in the office. It uses the typical red Dutch brick, which you see here. It has all the white lining around the windows and around the, the apartments, as had the houses from the 19th century. It's, it does exactly, it, it checks every box. With one sort of shift, it's transferred into a different language, let's say, into a different sort of grammar, um, well, contemporary grammar. We approach these schemes by sketches, sketches that are analog and digital as well. You see that, that clearly been treated by digital means, but if you look closer, they're all hand sketches, hand sketches in scale, one to 100, and we keep communicating with our clients through the sketches. Why? Because we notice that the clients, they're utterly afraid of digital drawings because digital drawings are finished in their perception. It's impossible for them as a client to change something. At least that's what they think. So in a sketch, they are totally rude. And they go, ah, give me the pen. I, I, I want it like this. Or, and then you get into this, into this process of collaboration, which actually makes a good design in the end. So here, the all th this is about 12 apartments. And all the different parties um, housing and working spaces actually, they had to find a mode how to design this building or how to um, configure the building. And um, that all needed to be fit into the city fabric. And um, what you see here is this typical traditional house. No, it has the white lining like we do, it has the red brick, it has, well, this, you can't really see it here, but anyway, it, it follows exactly the same, the same things. But then, differently, it has this wide zone in front where sort of you can either put your bicycle or in the evenings when you have the evening sun on there, people would, in the summer, not now, in our summer, would just sit outside and drink a beer together or just do a bit of talking. So how do you stack people? How do you stack houses so that everyone has the same sort of qualities inside the house and outside the house? You kind of get a sort of a complex geometry where every party has a direct access from the outside. It's very, very important in Holland that never mind which floor you live in, you have your own front door on the street. It leads to absurd sections. If you have like four apartments on top of each other, you have like one stair going up four floors, the second one just behind, shifted and behind, going up three, then the second one. So if you cut on the right side, on the right place, you have like only stairs. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a funny drawing actually. If you see it, you think like, uh, what's that, you know, <laughs> a bit odd. Um, well, there, there you see that again. Um, also, you see a certain flexibility in the re or in the, in the programming. Um, the houses, they're super neutral from the outside because that is what 19th century houses also is very um, characterized by, the neutrality of it. You don't really know whether this is a surgeon a dentist or a living room of somebody. And that's the point, no? I mean, at some stage, it's the living room. At another stage, it's a little insurance office or something, yeah? So this is exactly this sort of flexibility in the programming, in the genes that we are, we are trying to look for. Then again, test the different scenarios and different versions of it. and program shifting again, the sketches. And well, the ambition is always that we say like home is more than just a house. So it has it has a whole philosophy behind it, no? It has a, a connection with the neighbors and with the neighborhood and with the city um, around it. You see the roof terraces here on, on either side. So the roofscape is is very important. 
but for the rest, from the outside, it's an urban building. It's not individual housing. Well, it is individual housing, but not, you know. Well, this negotiation is like, how far do we get? And a lot of our projects, they deal with that question. And um, you're going you're gonna to see that in the next project, quickly flip through, which is in, in Leiden. Leiden is the university city in Holland where um, the, the, the oldest university, I think actually the oldest in Europe, if not worldwide, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a very old university, very traditional, and you see it, you see it in the city center, you see the medieval fortification structure, um, well, Holland is everything about water, so it's water everywhere, as you see. It's a bit like a mini version of Amsterdam, if you want. And then the 19th century programs, like infrastructure, like train tracks, but also industrial areas, they were just put around the city. Why? Because they are polluting, they're loud, they're, you know, they're stressful. So let's just keep them outside the city. What happened in the last gen century was that the city has grown obviously, and has swallowed these areas, still being productive places, which has risen a conflict, of course. And at the same time, um, almost 100 years later, delivers a potential because the industries have also grown and there's not enough space for both. So the industries has been moving out and leaving these blank spots behind like this old slaughterhouse area and, a, and a, a gas factory actually that has been transformed into an urban housing area. And the, the layout of the urban plan is very simple. It's dead simple. It's densification through the typical Dutch low-rise high density idea. Um, it's a block structure, 18 units back to back, side to side, next to each other. Every other street is, can be um, accessed by car, and the rest is just pedestrian in the middle of the city. Yeah? So this is between the city center and the central station. This is like um, uh, super central, let's say. And what we did is instead of following the usual way of having competitions and saying, okay, one architect is getting this block, another architect is getting this block, or maybe there's one architect is getting a few smaller blocks. We said like, okay, let's get all the architects in and let's say we negotiate that differently. We want to have a more individualized urban housing typology. So we want to increase the mixture of architecture and how can we reach that by mixing the architects. So our office, instead of, I think, first we were supposed to do the 23, which is this block, and then we ended up with getting 18 lots all over the place and just like bits and pieces. So again, the chainsaw model, which then formed the basis for a very rigid urban plan. But if you see the results, even though they're all following the same urban rules, like the same building envelope, and there were some sort of holy principles, they are creating a huge variety. And they all deal with a, it's not a very Catholic image, I'm afraid, but, <laughs> but they all deal with the question, who does the street belong to? If not us as a civic society, no, if not us as the people living there, why is everyone allowed to park his car in front of my house? I don't have a car, you know? So these sort of questions. And people started to take over the public spaces, blocking off <laughs> some of the streets, making them pedestrianized. And well, what happens was really interesting to see that actually, again, these huge windows, they are having a very intimate relationship with the public realm. And that is a funny 
sort of twist in the perception of the of the urban notion that we are able to create urban spaces with a very high quality in the middle of the city that are totally peaceful, free of infrastructure, free of these stressful moments that are following us around every other corner. So there you see the, the, the principal rules. Um, that is a very eight by eight traditional historical Leiden dimension so that you have sunlight more or less, let's say, at least half of the year. And then back-to-back -back car parks, they can only be accessed through these two roads from, from in between, no? from underneath. And that isn't a big problem because in this section, there's no daylight anyway. So for housing, it's totally useless. It would be lost space otherwise. But it keeps the street empty of that thing. One of the challenges is, of course, with such a section that you only have one facade facade which is based on a six meter grid 15 meter deep which if you imagine the sunlight in Holland if there's any at all um, <laughs> uh, it comes from a very uh, low angle and it's not very intense not like here today no so it's very uh, so people are really like like me um, whenever there is sunlight you go out, you immediately go out, because you never know for how long it's lasting. Five minutes, 10 minutes, and then it's raining again. So um, the question of the daylight and windows is a, is a very um, crucial, crucial question, of course. And it always evokes the conflict of privacy and public, no, as well. So how did we approach that? Um, we won the competition by making a, a basis grid system or by making a, a basis by developing a strategy how our buildings could be approached and what we did is actually that's derived from an old concept we followed in Temuco which uh, is the same by the way the same floor plan just a bit more bits and pieces but uh, the same principle that we kind of sorry we, we kind of put everything that we need to live, bathroom, kitchen, stairs, I don't know, but that we don't really want to see, we put on the side in a big cupboard. No, the cupboard is like two meter wide, 50 meter deep. And then we have the rest empty to create just space, basically. I mean, it's not a big thing anyway, but you know, so making double high spaces here, I think there's a model coming as well. Yeah, making double height spaces here to allow deeper sunlight, lifting this roof a little bit to have like just like 60 centimeter more daylight in here from that angle, um, increasing the width of the floor to make that a massive heat storage, let's say, that would actually collect it's also a passive house that would collect the heat during the day and release it during the night to counterbalance the, the, the amplitudes. Um, the roof obviously is the private garden since there's no backyard in a classical way. So also here, this sort of, here, this sort of tilting the roof allows for privacy so people cannot be seen from the street. No? Um, so you can actually sit on the roof um, in a very private way and just f do what everybody else is doing in the backyard. You know, uh, cutting your grass and, and whatever. Inside it's empty, no, it's just space. And the material which is uh, derived from an industrial material, it's just stretch metal actually has a very big advantage. It's actually much better inside than outside because there was no money for any detailing here. It's just like straight and harsh surfaces. This stretch metal allows for an acoustic buffer. Uh, there's a, a soft membrane behind it. And also if you, I think the image shows it quite nicely that the image is reflected through this angle of the stretch metal deep into the floor plan. So it is, is uh, something like that came very natural to us at a certain moment. And obviously from the outside, 
it's um, vandalism proof and uh, yeah, uh, very straightforward, simple detailing. It looks a bit more like a factory probably in that part, but it's from the inside then shows his different face. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> and in that cupboard is everything that we don't want to see. We are not very good in cleaning up the mess, so we just push it in, close the door, and forget about it. You know, simple. Then we found a fruit ladder from an orchard, orchard no? to, to pick apples. Um, that was moved, obviously, from the tree. Well, mind you, the tree is here, <laughs> so that wasn't needed anymore. <laughs> and um, that that whole that whole reflection on on how we live is obviously, as an architect, constantly superimposed by the fact: how are we technically doing it? How are we technically managing the housing question? Because there's high numbers, there's a fast production process, there's little money. So the constraints are very hard. And um, what we did in this project is we used a prefabricated concrete system that was actually placed all over the neighborhood. They all work with the same, with the same system. And then only on a second level, the, the structure became individualized. So they all have the same constructive system, but obviously different facade materials, different expressions, depending on the people living there. No? So very highly individualized. That's another one. I just show you quickly some of the of the 18 we did. I don't know how many. There's a lot of them in there. It doesn't want it really. The house with the swing. Also here, the uh, the question of the of well, that was still when the when neighbors went up, but this, that swing that turned into a neighborhood meeting point, which is amazing. Uh, it was really amazing. We have a a picture where the uh, the post delivery boy, you know, the one who brings the post, was photographed sitting on the pic on the swing just trying it out with his bag, all the letters hanging out there. And then he was getting up, that what the neighbors told us, and looking for the letterbox, because there's no letterbox, no? I mean, he didn't, he didn't really find it. If you look carefully, oh, you see that the entry door is actually on that side, behind there. For the rest, it's super low cost housing, super, super inexpensive housing. It only has one detail, no? It's the same window everywhere one detail that serves it all no so um here as well we had a bit of higher budget but then still a bit more than social housing but still pretty low and we could afford it because we were buying like different um, leftovers from other buildings that had a very nicely lined out facade, all the same, and we were just buying the scrap bits off. And what we did is, like, we didn't care really how white the strips were, as long as they were randomly put, um, and we got it very cheap. So that was how we got to realize this uh, zinc uh, facade. There's another one the same principle same idea once you have one metal dealer you know you find a lot of interesting products <laughs> it's like it's always the same problem right? you deal with what you have basically it's nothing is like coming from very far or sometimes you do things twice because they prove to be successful um, also because building is very easy no I mean if you're not very precise it doesn't matter this the, the, the idea that it's not perfect um, serves it um, pretty ideally. No, uh, that's another one uh, we did in in Amsterdam. Oh yeah, there's uh, see, there's the letterbox. Took him a while to figure that one out. 
that also, that, that's an interesting story about this one. The, the, the owner wanted a traditional Amsterdam house. And we said, uh, yeah, I mean, very nice, but please pick another architect because we're not very good in drawing historical plans and sections. He said, no, 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 no. no mm. But I want a brick building, a real brick building. That was our first brick building. And then we said, yeah, but you know, like a, a nice brick, it's not the cheapest material you can think of. He said, yeah, mm, okay. But how did they do it in the Middle Ages in Amsterdam? I mean, they, they took whatever they had, they built, and then they painted it black. That is also what we did here. So we, we found a very second-hand sort of rest product brick, let's say, a leftover. Um, and uh, again, the same strategy, because uh, it wasn't a perfect quality, um, but for us, painting it black would be no problem. You know, so actually the pictures before it was painted, the house looked horrible. No? It had like all different brick colors and sizes and stuff. And now it turned out to be very um, homogeneous. And that, um, the question of making a homogeneous building is a very crucial question in a neighborhood where every architect has his own language, his own way of dealing with materials, his own materialization. And actually that is where the detailing to us in the sense of the choice of a material becomes very important because we are, we are, we are walking next to the buildings and we, we touch them no, uh, physically. The streets are only eight meter, facades on both sides. So it's a very tactile moment. No? I mean, it's very physical in that sense. And we don't want to have too many of these materials, just choose one for every house, and then, then for the next one, the the next house. So here, this this issue of privacy was obviously a negotiation uh, on a more or less daily basis. Um, they could close these timber fins or open them and be more exposed to the neighborhood, more communicative, I suppose. Inside, same idea, no? Big cupboard on the left, put everything in. So it's more or less, they're all, you know, they're not very exciting. They all follow the same principles, let's say. But then in terms of, well, these, how does the facade work? How does it communicate to the city? How is that interaction with the urban space? That is a very important thing. I just flipped quickly flip through this was the house of a photographer so the central roof light was the place where everything in the building was sort of gathered around and again the the proximity of the material when you pass that building no? so it's, you're, you're very very dense and very very close to that that is just like painted timber. There you see it in as, a, as a whole. Again, using the roof as a roof terrace. That's why we are a bit higher. We don't like these, these banisters everywhere and all this. Again, no timber, metal, and so on. So just continue the facade till here. It's a, it's, it's a bit like this. No? Um, and then you're, you're safe. No? Um, Another transformation project on a totally different scale, not on an urban conversion area, but more in a monumental neighborhood in Rotterdam is this one. The neighborhood was designed by the Dutch architect Kreiwanger. He was uh, in the Netherlands of the 1910, 1920s, uh, the, the architect, um, just before the modern Jan Peter out and these guys uh, were big. He was the one that really introduced sort of a new thinking on housing. Um, but having said this, this is more than 100 years ago. So how do we deal with that heritage today? What would he has done? Oh, 
was one of the big issues we negotiated with the city. And then, um, as you may imagine, this is like this typical neighborhood, Dutch neighborhood, row housing, a little garden in the back. And then if you extend this, how do you deal with the privacy again? Well, the same principle as you saw here with these prefabricated timber fins. You see that you can't look in if you're on the neighboring um, allotment, but once you're inside, you have the full view to your own garden. And that sort of mechanis mechanism, that works pretty well. Um, it was sketched before, um, we have like tons of these sketches before we actually have it on site, obviously. Um, then it was drawn and well, you know the, the process. It was imagined like, okay, what would it be like? How is the, 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 the gradient? If you're cooking, you look out rectangular 90 degree angle, you have it all green. If you look to the neighbors, well, you really have to want to see them, no? Otherwise, they're, they're behind that screen, behind the filter, inside, outside. I quickly flip through it, but um, I think it gives gives the idea, no? And the detailing again here is like super important to us. If you look carefully, you can open the whole facade there, but these four centimeter wide profiles, they are exactly the profiles behind it of the glass. So that ideally you only have the material of these concrete fins and then the transparency of the glass itself. So merging inside and outside. No? I mean, this is probably a cultural difference to here where uh, I could imagine like maybe four weeks ago, outside is pretty harsh and hot and hostile. I mean, for us, it's, it's like an urge you know, to open everything. And if we can't at least make it transparent and from glass. No? But also the question, how do you deal with, a, with a, that historical building? Um, I want to go back once. Um, obviously, you have the old floor and the new floor. So this is this is the section, the, the well, the extension, let's say. But also here, there's a roof light. So whenever you walk down, also the height difference, you walk down into the new part of the building, and then you look up, and you see through the roof light, you see the brick facade from the outside. So you look even though you're inside, you look onto your historical building from the inside of your um, living space, which is sort of a very um, architectural experience, I would say, in the a bit an odd thing to say, but but uh, still, it's very it de it deals with the question: How do you connect, you no, know, with history, and how do you do you have a clear division, like in that case, or do you join it? Do you merge it more? Um, in our th in our case, we saw that extension more being part of the garden than being part of the building, obviously, and that was the reason why we why we had that very clear cut. And again, using the materials we find in place, there was we had to cut down one tree, um, and the municipality forced us, but also we wanted it to bring back the tree. So we dried it, we sawed it up, and kind of integrated it in the, in the building. No? Um, later I read that a Swiss colleague, uh, an older generation colleague, Luigi Snozzi, he did with his first semester students this little test before they were allowed to get into his studio, and they were asked to design a house around a cherry tree. And everyone that didn't touch the cherry tree. In other words, they didn't cut it down. They were not allowed to enter. Because he said, like, as an architect, you're going to transform nature, you're going to transform space, you're going to transform everything. The question is, how do you do it and what are you going to do with it? So if you use it as a floor, probably fine, you know, but do something with the things you have available. Um, Internal transparencies also, no, when you kind of the, the, the side lines. That one. Uh, 
quickly go through this one. Um, that's a more recent one. Uh, the biggest project we did so far, it's the conversion of an old brewery in Bavaria. Bavaria is the beer drinking part of Germany. So whenever you think of Germany, you think of beer, sausages, and these funny hats with a, I don't know what that's called in English. I don't even know what that's called in German, to be honest. They look funny and they are funny, but they have these old brewery areas in the city fabric and uh, they're huge areas, actually three hectare, um, that are transformed into a city quarter. Not only housing, but also office space, working space, uh, infrastructure to a certain degree, um, commercial spaces, well, a, a part of the city, let's say. So um, for us, an ideal condition to, uh, to enter that competition. And um, it was even more interesting when we found out, I, I've never been to that place before actually, but when we visited it, it was super interesting to see that the city was put in this hilly landscape and then you have this three tremendous rivers, well, the Danube, which is the biggest in Europe, that's overwhelming, the Inn, which is the biggest in Austria, and one of the biggest passing Germany, um, and then a little bit smaller ones, but still pretty not bad. And the city was built in this peninsula, the old city, with a bishop in the middle, of course. It's very Catholic, Bavaria, a bit like Chile. Um, and then you have here a part of the old city extension, and one bridge going over. And that bridge is very important because, well, now it's it's a bit more open, but uh, everything that's behind here is Austria. It's not Germany anymore. So this part of the country is only be accessible by one bridge, which is very peculiar in a way, especially if you think about that they put a beer brewery there, which is like their their you know their it's what they need to survive. So it's almost a dangerous thing. Um, then there's uh, vistas and connections to, well, as I said, no, the bishop and the castle and, well, a very strategic point, obviously, um, from, a, from a historic point of view. So I'm going the wrong way. And these different identities that merge right onto that side. Are we part of the historical center? Are we part of the suburbia from Austria? Or are we part of that landscape hill? And the design suggested different areas. An urban continuation of the, of the urban fabric, which is a sort of a super block, if you want. Um, the integration of existing structures, buildings, that were there, very nicely put in the landscape, and a sort of a landscape typology which had these very slender, sort of small towers, if you want, that are put between the trees. That's what it looked in the model. So what we said is actually the medieval city stops here and the landscape starts here. And we did this because it enriched the new neighborhood in such a way that we ha could integrate these both identities into the center of that neighborhood. And wherever you go, wherever you walk, you always have that relation either to the historical context or to the landscape context. So this ambiguity was really driving the design. And again, Probably because it's a it's a hand drawing that it doesn't like beamers and stuff. It's not a GIF, by the way. In case you think it's moving, there's nothing moving. It's it's really it's just ink, like it used to be ink. Um, approaching it and then as it was built, and there you see the castle, for example. On the other side is a monastery. Um, yeah, and that courtyard is quite a thing because 
in the medieval cities, the courtyards, they were very active places. They were productive spaces. A lot of little industries and craftsmanship was put there. Then they were privatized, basically after the war from the 50s onwards, closed to public. And now we have that shift back where we start opening them again and allowing sort of a collective uses in there and sort of an accessibility and a, a, a passing through, um, finding your way through that part of the city. So you don't really know whether you are inside a courtyard or whether you are on the street. And what is the difference anyway? You know, that sort of blending um, spaces. Um, yeah, and also in the programming, there's surgeons, there's a computer company down here, there's houses, everything is sort of mixed. And again, the same strategy as in Rotterdam, we can do it, at least we think we can do it, because the outside is not an expression of every individual inside, not like in Leiden, it's a collective good, let's say, it's part of the city. section and there you see how it goes up how it it uses the the historical structure and the vistas and, and all that and the edges of the block from the outside they create these little plazas or the little squares it's very, very tiny, no? This is just a bakery and you can get a coffee and just sit under that big tree. So very situational approach, actually. That's the main road to Austria. Actually, the, the, the border is right there. <laughs> oh, going the wrong way. So again, the proximity, wherever we are close to the facade, the material is very sort of warm, it's, very, it's, it's softer, and wherever we have a bigger distance, here there's only cars, it's concrete, then this is stucco, so it, it has a sort of a sequence and a distance to the material. Then the spaces, we don't know whether they're private or collective or public or we don't care. And whenever there's housing, people would get the opportunity to sort of make a little privacy buffer. It's not l like a real garden, actually. It's more like a bit of greenery, like a, s a green screen to being not totally imposed to um, visitors or to people who just pass by. How are we time-wise? Yeah? Okay. Then I leave it here. Next time I come, I'll show you this one, <laughs> which is obviously in Holland, and it's the conversion of a port. But uh, I, think, I think it's all set, and uh, it would just be like yet another interpretation of, uh, uh, of, of that, let's say, philosophy. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, okay. If I mean, if you if you have questions, I'd be here. Or, I mean, I totally understand that you want to get out into the sun. Um, I'm, I'm going to be here anyway. And uh, those who are interested in the summer school uh, are invited to come back over five minutes. And um, yeah, get out.